Hello everyone. My name is Anil Gemiri. I'm an associate clinical professor at University of California, San Francisco, Fresno Branch Campus. Today I will be talking about chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis as a part of an interstitial lung disease educational series organized by California Thoracic Society and BI. The objectives of this session will be to understand the epidemiology of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, recognize the diagnostic challenges associated with uh, diagnosing hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Then we'll discuss about new classifications and guidelines that have come up uh, discussing hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Then I will discuss about some principles of management. Then we'll end the talk with some suggestions, what are the future guidance for the field of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis in the coming days. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is defined as an inflammatory and or a fibrotic disease affecting the lung parenchyma and small airway disease that results from an immune-mediated response to an inhaled antigen in a susceptible individual. The inhaled antigen could be an overt antigen or could be an occult antigen. In the past, traditionally, hypersensitivity pneumonitis has been classified as acute, subacute, and chronic. That classification did not have any prognostic or any uh, important information regarding patient care, and there was more confusion about the subacute nature of the uh, that category. When did acute started? When did it become subacute? And when did it become chronic? That time frame was confusing. That's why it was not very helpful. In last few years, there has been more information and there's more studies that shows that the presence of fibrosis in a patient with hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a significant determinant of prognosis. Based on that finding, the current guidelines and the societies have adopted a new nomenclature for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. From here on, we, it's going to be called fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis and non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. The pathogenesis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis revolves around interactions between a susceptible individual and that individual's reaction to exposure to an inciting agent. When a susceptible individual is exposed to an uh, external antigen, that activates its immune system. The innate immune system is activated. That leads to sensitization of that individual to that antigen. When this happens repeatedly, that process of sensitization further goes into inflammatory response in the lungs and perpetuates a process of inflammation in the lungs. When this repeated exposure happens over a long, prolonged period of time, that inflammatory response and that immune regulation becomes a little bit dysregulated and, and leads to further injury to the lung parenchyma and airways which ultimately develops into the scarring and fibrotic process that leads to a chronic fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This is the current understanding model of hypersensitivity pneumonitis at this point. But we have to acknowledge that uh, there is significant gap exists uh, in our knowledge about exact pathophysiology, exact mechanism, how uh, this process evolves over time, and what are the further genetic susceptible factors in an individual that predisposes uh, that person to develop chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So this process and this is still evolving and we're going to need more research to better understand the exact pathophysiology of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. The agents that lead to development of hypersensitivity pneumonitis are broadly categorized into organic particulate matter and non-organic particulate matters. In the organic particulate matters, there can be microbes, uh, it can be a bacteria, fungi, protozoa, 
or it could be any animal or um, plant proteins. In non-organic matters, it could be metals, exposure to metals. It could be low molecular weights like uh, isocyanates and acid and hydrides. It is likely that the exposures that lead to chronic hypersensitivity and pneumonitis involves more than one inciting agent at any point of time. It is possible that there might be one antigen that initiates the sensitization process, but when it cross-reacts with other antigens, exposures to these other antigens without having prior sensitization might still lead to development of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. The exposure to these inciting agents can happen at any places at work, it can happen at home, or it can happen at places that the person regularly visits, like their gymnasium or church or any other places that takes them to, um, like there are some hobbies might take them to different places, and that might be the site of uh, uh, exposure. It is also important to realize that there are other contributing factors that might play into the sensitization process. For example, cigarette smoking is considered to be protective against development of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Similarly, uh, air amb ambient air pollution and uh, uh, farmers who use pesticides uh, during farming seasons might play role in sensitization process. Uh, similarly, a viral infection might play some role in sensitization of uh, the individual person to an inciting agent. Here is a list of diseases that are associated with uh, antigen exposure and that leads to a specific kind of a disease that we know of. As you can see from this slide, there are there could be potentially more than one antigen that can lead to the same disease. So this tells us that there might be very there might be antigens that are shared between these inciting agents and sensitization to one of them can lead to development of hypersensitivity pneumonitis from exposure to the other antigens. The genetic susceptibility that increases the risk of developing hypersensitivity pneumonitis are predominantly traced to genes that are involved in antigen processing and antigen presentation. The polymorphism in the MSM2 molecules are one of the most commonly identified polymorphisms associated with patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Similarly, uh, genes that are involved in lung repair mechanisms like proteasomes and transporters, polymorphism in those genes are also associated with risk of developing hypersensitivity pneumonitis. These are more com these are combined in fibrotic and non-fibrotic diseases. But specific to fibrotic diseases, there has been multiple mutations and polymorphisms has been identified in patients with chronic fibrotic chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. The shortening of telomeres and coding mutations of telomere gene are associated more with fibrotic lung disease in general, not only fibrotic SP, but also other fibrotic lung diseases. Uh, mucin 5B promoter polymorphism is also associated with increased uh, in, it's seen more in patients with hypersensitive pneumonitis, mainly the fibrotic one. And microchimerism, which is described as presence of genetically different cell in a genetically different person, uh, the, the, the example of which is a natural pregnancy. Uh, the presence of microchimerism has also been identified as a risk factor for development of HP, especially with, uh, among women. The true prevalence of hypersensitivity pneumonitis remains unknown uh, because of the challenges of the diagnosis. But from this um, claim-based cohort analysis of a US-based population uh, that was published in 2018, shows that the prevalence of hypersensitivity pneumonitis has been increasing over the years among adults and older adults, especially people who are older than 65 years old, age has increased prevalence of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. We have to remember that this is a claim-based analysis of US population. It is assumed that 
the prevalence of hypersensitive dendermonitis varies according to geographical location, uh, according to worldwide, uh, uh, maybe different countries have different kind of uh, prevalence. And also it, it varies by uh, predominant industry in that area and some cultural rituals and habits that uh, that person has that will expose them to uh, certain different kind of antigens. So based on this, there, there is increasing prevalence of hypersensitive dendermonitis among uh, US population. When looked into two different categories as fibrotic and non-fibrotic, it is clear that most of the increase in incidence uh, is driven by the non-fibrotic component. Uh, it is increasing among adults and, and people pay more than 65 year old. But in terms of fibrotic disease, if you look at it closely, most of the increase in prevalence of HP in fibrotic disease belongs to uh, age group 65 and older. So that is becoming more prevalent as, as US if the population grows older, the fibrotic uh, HP is becoming more prevalent. In referral ILD clinics and population, uh, uh, it has been reported that prevalence of ILD ranges between 18 to 30 percent. In a recent study about progressive phenotypes of ILD uh, that studied an antifibrotic agent uh, among patients who had ILD and had progressive phenotype, Hypersensitivity in pneumonitis was the most common fibrotic ILD that was studied. Similarly, uh, a recent data that came out from India, where they looked at uh, all the newcomers' uh, ILD diagnosis, they found that 47% of their uh, ILD diagnosis were hypersensitivity in pneumonitis. And there was another study that in a, in a transplant patients for IPF, when they looked at and restudied the the explanted tissue from the, from the transplant, they found that the, the transplanted tissue had features of hypersensitivity pneumonitis in 16% of the explanted tissue. In another study uh, where they looked at all the IPF patients that were diagnosed, when they went back and started taking detailed history of exposure assessment and went back and evaluated the pathology again, up to 43% of patients who were initially diagnosed as IPF were relabeled as chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So this tells us that probably our understanding of chronic hypersensitivity is still inadequate. The prevalence might be much more than we think. And frequently, fibrotic HP is misdiagnosed as an IPF. So how do we make a diagnosis? So there are three main uh, uh, domains of diagnosis in for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. We need to have an accurate assessment of exposure. Then we need imaging evidence of uh, certain changes in the radiology. Then plus and minus bronchoscopy and pathology. Based on these three information, we go about making diagnosis of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This table gives us different exposure assessment tools that are available out there. Some of them are available, some of them are not. Some of them have very good utility, clinical utility, some of them do not have. It. The exposure assessment starts with a very careful and detailed history of patients' work, home, hobbies, and the places they visit. And this is a fundamental to clinical assessment of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. But it is known that up to 50%, more than 50% of patients with HP do not have an identified exposure. So history alone is not enough. There has been development of detailed questionnaires to capture these infrequent exposures in patients with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. But this, there has not been a, a well-validated and, and one that can be broadly used all over the country. When these questionnaires are developed, they need to reflect the local pattern of uh, exposures, disease, industry, and what kind of exposures are more common in that area. So it's important to have that locally developed and locally validated. 
after the history and questionnaire, if they are not sufficient and if there is still high suspicion for chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis, the next step will be to hire an industrial hygienist to do a detailed assessment of home, work, and uh, other places. They come and take samples from these areas and go and assess and look for uh, different antigens. This is very important, but not widely available for um, in many parts of the country. And they are still not standardized uh, across different parts of the country. But it is something that needs to be taken uh, if their suspicion for exposure remains high. The other uh, assessment tool that's available is measurement of serum precipitins. These are immunoglobulins that mark uh, the sensitization process. The presence of these immunoglobulins in patients who are suspected of hypersensitivity pneumonitis tells us that the patient has been exposed and sensitized. Beyond that, it does not have more significant clinical value. The presence of these antibodies do not necessarily make the diagnosis of SP, nor the absence of these antibodies rule out hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This can be only helpful in a, in a supportive uh, evidence, but not a definitive evidence. And there are lymphocyte proliferation, proliferation tests that can be done, uh, but this is mainly done in research settings. The another area that can help uh, assess uh, antigen exposure is if the disease or, or radiology improves um, when the patient or the person is taken out of that environment. But again, that is also not definite evidence because disease can still progress even if they are out of the exposure area. But that definitely helps uh, support the diagnosis that might be the exposure might be playing a role in the patient's hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Next, the imaging evidence. Uh, high resolution CT scans are absolutely needed to make a diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. The images are taken in supine position and it should be taken as an inspiratory and expiratory film with volumetric acquisition and reconstruction of thin images. Basically, what we are looking here is abnormalities of parenchymal disease infiltration and abnormalities in the small airways. Based on the findings of this radiology, the imaging findings can be classified as, categorized as typical for HP, compatible with HP, and indeterminate for HP. In non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, the most common finding that is seen is what we call mosaic attenuation. These are diffuse ground glass opacities that spares some areas giving rise to this mosaic attenuation. Sometimes centrilobular nodules are also seen. When that person, that film is taken in expiratory phase, that area of mosaic attenuation and areas of hypolucensis can become exaggerated in the image that's seen on the right side that suggests small airway disease leading to air trapping during expiration. This is what is seen in non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. As the disease progresses and becomes fibrotic, there are more reticulations, more fibrosis, some architectural distortions. Any advanced phase of this disease almost can mimic uh, fibrotic, other fibrotic ILDs like IPF. Here we can still see some areas of air trapping and some areas of hypolucency, but in the advanced chronic fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, all these distortion and architectural destruction can mimic uh, IPF uh, findings. One of the findings uh, on CT scan for fibrotic lung disease, which is very specific, and, and when you see this, you can fairly make an accurate diagnosis of SP is what we call three density pattern. Basically, what you see here is all three densities, like a normal lungs, uh, a lung that has been infiltrated by lymphocytes and inflammatory cells that gives you ground glass opacities, and an area of the lung that has air trapping. 
So when all these three are identified in a CT scan, it's called a three density pattern. And presence of this three density pattern is highly specific for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. The bronchoscopy has some role in diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Its role is still not very clear and could be controversial at some times. Most of the time what we look for bronchoscopy in hypersensitivity pneumonitis is presence of lymphocytosis. What exact amount of lymphocytosis supports the diagnosis of HP is not clear. In non-fibrotic HP, the range of lymphocytosis ranges between 20 to 40 percent. And the recent guidelines from ATS suggest that more than 20 percent of lymphocytes would support diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. However, it is not clear that same threshold stands true for fibrotic lung disease also, fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis also. Right now, it's not clear what should be the threshold for lymphocytosis in fibrotic chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, but it is still important to do BAL lymphocytosis analysis because the presence of lymphocytosis in hypersensitivity pneumonitis, even fibrotic, is in general higher than other fibrotic lung diseases. So it still has some discriminatory value uh, even in fibrotic lung disease. So the current ATS guidelines suggest uh, BAL lymphocytosis analysis in fibrotic lung disease. The next uh, information that we can get from bronchoscopy and biopsy is the biopsy uh, that can help with the diagnosis of uh, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. If there's still confusion and if the diagnosis is not clear, then the lung biopsy can help. But the diagnosis Diagnostic yield of transbronchial lung biopsy is very poor. It's only around 50%, and it might be even lower than that in fibrotic uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Recently, transbronchial um, lung cryobiopsy has become more popular, and, and there are many centers that are expert on these procedures that are doing it routinely for ILD, started doing routinely for ILD workup. It is considered equivalent in terms of accuracy to surgical lung biopsy, but it is less invasive than surgical lung biopsy and the, and the safety profile is very good compared to surgical lung biopsy. So the further study needs to be done in this area where transbronchial lung biopsy can replace surgical lung biopsy or not. But you definitely need a surgical lung biopsy to exclude hypersensitive pneumonitis completely. A definite exclusion will need a surgical lung biopsy. When you have a pathology available for uh, diagnosis of hypersensitive pneumonitis, the things that can support HP over other fibrotic lung diseases are fibrosis that is around bron bronchioles. It's called peribronchial fibrosis, presence of granulomas, and the bridging fibrosis, meaning the fibrosis between the alveolar area that connects with two, alveolar, uh, two bronchioles. That bridging fibrosis is also supportive for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. In the advanced phase of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, when the bridging fibrosis is very extensive, it can almost look like an UIP pattern. And there can be presence of fibroblastic foci's in fibrotic HP, but these are mainly located around the bronchioles. That is the differentiating feature between UIP and uh, fibroblastic foci for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Another unique findings um, in chronic HP pathology is peribronchiolar metaplasia. Uh, if that's present, that supports diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So based on this, you can see even pathology can be difficult. It might be even hard to differentiate between UIP and fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, even with pathology information. So this uh, table lists the differences we just talked about. Uh, fibrotic CSP versus IPF. So chronic HP is mainly mid and upper zone. It's rarely in lower zone, whereas IPF is usually in the lower zone. 
presence of peribronchiolar fibrosis with fibroblastic phocytes are integral part of uh, CHP, uncommon in IPF. Bridging fibrosis are rare in IPF. Fibroblastic phocytes are abundant and profuse in IPF and they are not peribronchiolar. Subpleural fibrosis is extensive in IPF. It can be present in chronic HP, but less, less marked and less common. Giant cell granulomas are more common in chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis. And honeycombing, another integral part of identifying IPF, can be present even in fibrotic HP. So differentiating CHP from IPF is challenging, despite all the information we get from bronchoscopy, exposure assessment, and radiology. And during these situations is where some of the molecular studies have shown some promise to help differentiate between these two diseases. This study that was done in 2020 in Japan, uh, they, they looked at gene expression profile between patients with fibrotic uh, CHP and, and, and IPF. What they found was they both diseases shared certain genes that were upregulated and downregulated, but there were certain genes that were upregulated specific to CSP and downregulated specific to CSP. So this might be a promising area where further research needs to be done so that we can accurately classify and diagnose CSP and discriminate between IPF and CSP. Once we have all those information uh, from bronchoscopy, radiology, and, and exposure assessment, then we go into a multidisciplinary assessment kind of approach where all three areas, diagnostic domains, if they point towards HP, meaning there's an accurate exposure assessment, there is radiology that supports diagnosis of HP, and BAL shows lymphocytosis, then you have a high confidence that's the patients with a chronic HP. Any combination of those three diagnostic domains should lead to a multidisciplinary discussion. Based on that, next step would be a, a biopsy. Whether a, a transbronchial lung biopsy versus a surgical lung biopsy, we already discussed that. Transbronchial lung cryobiopsy might be sufficient in most of these cases, based on depending on the expertise level available at that institution. Once you put that information Again, you go back to multidisciplinary discussion and come back with level of confidence that you can have uh, based on all those information. This is a nice algorithmic uh, approach that uh, recent ATS guideline has suggested uh, in terms of making a diagnosis of HP, either definite high confidence or low confidence. So this should be utilized uh, during the uh, multidisciplinary discussion sessions and come to a conclusion of the certainty of uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis diagnosis. The prognostic factors uh, that matter in CHP, as I alluded earlier, the most important one is the presence of fibrosis radiologically or, or in the pathology. Either way, presence of fibrosis is the most important determinant of prognosis in patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Similarly, the exposure factors that lead to high intensity exposure for a prolonged time might be another important prognostic factor. If the inciting agent cannot be identified, then that might be a bad prognostic marker. And there has been studies that support that in SP, if there is no identifiable inciting agent, those group of patients have poor outcomes than people who have identified inciting agents. Increasing age, male gender are also important. And in the pulmonary function test, the tests that reflect increasing fibrosis, meaning continued reduction in force vital capacity, reduced diffusion capacity, those are also important prognostic form markers. However, further studies need to be done to accurately predict which one of them are the more important beyond pulmonary fibrosis.
The management of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis involves antigen avoidance, pharmacological therapy, adjunctive treatments, and lung transplant. Of course, the antigen avoidance is the mainstay and the cornerstone of management of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. But it's quite challenging uh, because, as I earlier said, 50% of more than 50% of patients with HP do not have an identifiable source of exposure. When you don't have a source of exposure, remedying that is impossible. Even if you find an exposure, after getting rid of exposure source, it has been shown that disease can continue to progress. And it is important to realize that microscopic antigens has been identified inside the house even after the source has been remediated. So it is possible that even after you get rid of the source, disease can progress. Either there are still presence of microscopic antigens in the, in the environment, or the person's genetic underpinnings and, and underlying pathophysiology has, has moved to a process where disease can progress despite getting rid of the exposure. So it is challenging also in other sense that even if the source is identified, our recommendations to remove that source from their environment, meaning a dog or a cat, getting rid of that sometimes is challenging because people have long, long-standing relationship with those animals. Similarly, asking someone to change their job and that might be the sole breadwinner of the family might be still challenging. So antigen avoidance is the main cornerstone of treatment, but it's always challenging. And even it is more challenging when the source is not identified. What do we do if we don't know the source, the source is? There is no a validated and well-studied algorithm or strategy to involve when the source is not identified. And very important in the future that we study and come up with some strategy and plan uh, to mitigate this uh, situation when the inciting agent is not identified. The pharmacotherapy of chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis involves anti-inflammatory agents, immunosuppressants, and antifibrotics. It is important to understand that there is not solid hard evidence at this point to guide any of this pharmacotherapy in any individual patient. Most of the suggestions that are now and, and in current practice are based on retrospective studies, expert opinions, or observational studies. Even some of the current practice reflects the extrapolation from non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis and also from some fibrotic lung diseases like IPF. Among the anti-inflammatory agents, uh, prednisone and steroids are the mainstay of treatment. If someone has radiological evidence, ongoing exposure that cannot be identified and, and progressive declining lung function, it is worthwhile to try prednisone and as an anti-inflammatory agent. The response definitely will be better with non-fibrotic, but it is worth trying even in fibrotic chronic SP. If the response is good, after four to six weeks, you see the improvement in pulmonary function tests and radiological improvement. It is okay and it is advisable to continue the anti-inflammatory agents and switch them to one of the immunosuppressants like mycophenolate or azathioprine because there has been studies that retrospective although that has shown that mycophenolate and azathioprine are better tolerated long term uh, in patients who require immunosuppressants in chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis than prednisone. But these again are retrospective studies. It needs to be validated in the prospective trials. The immunosuppressants used primarily in fibrotic lung disease related to chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis is unclear. The use of immunosuppressants in chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis is not clear. Some retrospective studies suggested that weaning patients from prednisone to mycophenolate or azathioprine was better tolerated, but there are no direct evidence to suggest that any immunosuppressants are superior or better in the management of fibrotic HP. In fact, 
the Panther IPF trial that was done in patients with IPF with prednisone as a thyperine and anestylcysteine actually showed the worst outcome in patients who were on these immunosuppressants. So we have to be cautious about using these and immunosuppressants in patients with fibrotic ILDs until we have better solid evidence to suggest otherwise. The next group of drugs that can be used in chronic fibrotic HP are antifibrotics. This, there, are, there was a recent study that showed that patients with progressive phenotype of ILD that included chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis and which was actually the most common uh, fibrotic lung disease in that study showed that use of antifibrotic agents showed decline in FVC. So there are some preliminary and some evidence now that antifibrotics might work in patients who have fibrotic CSP. But at this point, we don't know how we should approach the combination of antifibrotics and immunosuppressants. Because that study I just mentioned actually excluded patients who were already on immunosuppressants. So the future studies should focus on and, and compare either only antifibrotics or combination of antifibrotics with, uh, with immunosuppressants. So that should be the future study that should look at specifically in patients with chronic fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Other modalities of treatment that are available to patients with chronic HP are lung transplant, uh, progressive symptoms, worsening lung function despite adequate medical therapy should uh, lead to consideration for lung transplant in these patients. Uh, the, the, the response to lung transplant, the survival is much better in chronic HP than in IPF. However, the IP, uh, chronic HP can recur in patients with uh, transplant if they possibly continue to have the same exposure. Other adjunctive treatment for chronic HP are pulmonary rehabilitation and oxygen supplementation. The evidence is not as robust or as, as specific as it is in COPD and other INDs, but these are the other treatment that should be considered in patients who have progressive chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. At the end, uh, I want to talk about the, what, are, what should be the future direction in the field of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Now that we have a, a uniform nomenclature and, and a standard approach to diagnosis, it is hoped that application of that nomenclature and standard process will lead to a better definition of a patient population of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis on which future trials can be conducted that will give us better idea about response of all these treatments in patients with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. We also need to better, we need to learn more about our exposure science. What is the relationship between exposure, the dose, host interaction between the inciting agents? How can we develop more strategies where to remediate antigens when they are identified and versus when they are not identified? We also need more, need to learn more about the molecular biomarkers, genetic underpinnings of patients that increases the risk of developing hypersensitivity pneumonitis, the risk of progression. We need more molecular studies and biomarkers and gene expression studies to, to assess that group of patients better. Ultimately, what matters the most is the clinical trials geared specific towards fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis that can improve patient-related outcomes. At the end, we know that there's significant gap exists in understanding of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And the new guidelines, both from ATS and ACCP, lay the foundation for future developments. And it is recommended that given the difficulties and challenges associated with making a diagnosis, a multidisciplinary approach be used in the diagnosis of chronic HP. It's also important to realize that fibrotic HP can be misdiagnosed as IPF. And it is also important that we start taking exposure history a little bit seriously and take that exposure history in all the patients with ILD cases that we see in our clinic.